the next few SQLite screencasts, I'm going to talk in more detail about the four fundamental functions of SQLite, namely creating, reading, updating, and deleting records. In fact, you've probably heard of these functions before by their acronym, which is CRUD. In this screencast, I'm going to focus on how to create or insert records using SQLize. Now, if you've watched the previous screencasts in this series, you'll already know that we can create a record using a model's create method like this. According to the SQLize documentation, what we're doing here is creating a persistent instance of the model. In simpler words, as soon as you call the create method, Internally, SQLize will immediately persist the model instance to the database. So right now, if we look at the contents of the articles table, you can see that there are no records. However, if we save this script and then run it, and then go back to Workbench and refresh the contents of the table, you can see that the record was inserted immediately as soon as we call that create method. What you might not already know is that you can also create what is known as a non-persistent instance using the model's build function like this. If we run the script this time, you'll see that we don't get an error, which means the build function is valid. However, unlike before, we don't see any trace of the SQL statement that was generated by SQLize. And if we look in the database, because we wipe the database every time the script is run, the database is going to be empty. We've managed to create a record, but we have not yet persisted it. So the name non-persistent instance might sound complex, but all it means is that instead of creating and then immediately persisting the model, build just creates the model instance. It doesn't actually persist it until you call the save method. Now, if I run this script, you can see that the SQL was generated and written to the console. And if we look at the contents of the table in Workbench, the record has been saved. On the surface, it looks like we have two ways of accomplishing the same thing. But what's especially useful about the build function is that it gives us this immediate reference to the model instance. Now, in this contrived example, it's not really so useful, but in certain scenarios, especially when working with many-to-many -many relationships, SQLize will add contextual methods to the object that we can utilize. I'm going to talk more about these so-called contextual methods in a future episode on relationships. For now, I just want to make you aware that this build function exists, and for the most part, you can use build and create interchangeably, depending on your preference. You could, by the way, if you wanted to, remove the intermediate variable and just call save on the object returned by build immediately, but in which case you might as well just use the create function. This create function, as well as the save function we just looked at, are asynchronous, meaning they will potentially take some time, maybe even a few seconds, to finish saving the record. Instead of making you wait for the operation to finish before running any more code, these functions immediately return a promise object that represents the state of the operation. By default, the state is pending, but you can actually attach a callback function to be called when the promise has been fulfilled, or in other words, when the operation has finished. Often when you supply a callback like this, it's because you want to access new information about the record you just inserted. Information like the auto incremented primary key value, or maybe the created at or updated at values that SQLize generates dynamically. In those cases, you can define a single argument for the callback function, which is an object that represents the just inserted record. I'll call this argument inserted article because it represents the article we just inserted. If you write the argument to the console, you'll see quite a verbose output. Sometimes this information is useful, but in my experience, all you really want most of the time is this data values property, which contains information about the actual values represented by the instance. Just to be clear, this is just a JavaScript object, which means within our JavaScript code, we can access that data values property using a refinement like this. Now, if I clear the console and rerun that script, you can see that the output is much more concise and to the point. As you can see, the primary key created at and updated values were all effectively set by SQLize after we inserted the record. 
If we wanted to, we could write this information to a log, or in the case of the primary key, ID, we could actually use the generated value to define a foreign key for an associated record. That is probably the most common reason to want to access the primary key. But again, we'll talk more about associations in a later video. For now, let's look at a handy little feature that allows us to whitelist settable attributes in SQLize. So SQLize has a neat little feature that can improve the resilience of your code, especially when inserting user submitted form data. In order to effectively demonstrate this feature, I'm going to ask you to pretend that this is an express web server and that this article was actually submitted by a user via a HTTP request. So to make that more realistic, I'm going to extract the object and put in a variable called results that has a body property whose value is the request body. Actually, this should be called rec, short for request. And if you've ever done any kind of Express.js programming, this kind of object structure should be really familiar to you. If you're not too familiar with Express, it shouldn't really matter. Suffice to say, this object just represents data supplied by the user. And in this case, we could reasonably pass the value of rec.body to the create function. So that now when we run the code, it pretty much does the exact same thing. It takes the value of that body property and puts it in the database. There's nothing inherently wrong with passing rec.body to the create function like this, but let's add a new requirement. Let's say the articles must first be approved by an administrator before they appear on the website. So what I can do to accommodate that requirement is add a new attribute to the article model called approved, set its data type to be a Boolean, and give it a default value of false because by default, articles should not be approved. If I save this script and run the code, we should now see that within the table, there is an approved column and the default value is zero. Zero is synonymous with false and one is synonymous with true. The trouble with this code is that a malicious user could potentially augment the request body to include an approved attribute or an approved key and set the value to something like true. In which case, because the keys of the request body match that of the model, when we run this code, and then look at the results. The approved value is now one, which means this article would appear on the homepage right away and totally undermine the administrator, which is obviously no good. There's actually a few ways around this problem, but one of the most resilient is to whitelist settable attributes using SQLize. Let me show you what I mean. We can pass to the create method a second argument that is an object of a field property. That field property is an array and each element in this array is the name of the attribute to allow setting. So we want the user to be able to set the title. So we're going to put title in there and we want the user to be able to set the body. So we're going to put the body attribute name in there, but we do not want to allow the user to set the approved attributes at this point in the code. So we're not going to add the approved attribute name to this array. Now, when we run this code and look at the results, you can see that even though the user set the approved attribute to true, SQLize doesn't care. Because we didn't whitelist it as being settable, it's not going to be set when we call the create method in this particular case. Something else you're likely to want to do at some point or another with SQLize is insert multiple records at once. Of course, if you want to insert multiple records at once, you could just call the create method a bunch of times in a loop or something, but SQLize provides a much more elegant way to do this using a method called bulk create. Using this bulk create method, you can pass an array of records to create like this. Okay, let's see what happens when we run this code. It might be a little bit hard to read in this condensed format, but if you look carefully, we can see that we're actually introducing two sets of values. If we look at Workbench and refresh the table contents, you can see now that Article 1 and Article 2 have been inserted into the database, and we managed to do so in a very declarative and succinct manner thanks to this bulk create function. Just like the create and save functions we looked at earlier in this video, bulk create is an asynchronous function, and as such, it returns a promise. If you want to do something after bulk create is finished running, you need to call then on the promise returned by bulk create and pass to it a callback. Bulk create, by the way, can also take a second argument, an options argument, and on that options argument, you can whitelist settable attributes, just like you could with the create function.
I didn't mention this at the time, but you can also do this with the build function as well. The documentation will elaborate on that if you're interested. I'm not going to belabor this whitelist anymore. One thing I will mention concerning bulk create is that according to the documentation, this bulk create function was designed to be fast. And one way it manages to do that is to skip validation. In other words, by default, if you've defined any sort of validation rules for your model, bulk create will just disregard them. If you can afford the performance hits, and if you care about validation, as I suspect you do, you can re-enable validation by passing, again, that options argument and setting validate to true. Something else that's really cool about bulk create that you can't get with a regular create is this ignore duplicates option. So sometimes you want to insert multiple records and if there's a duplicate, you just want to ignore the error. And if you're wondering, hey, when is this actually useful? Well, let me show you an example. This is a project I worked on uh, quite a long time ago now actually, where I defined a very simple tag model. As you can see, it's just got a single property called tag name. And what I wanted to do is associate tags with blog posts, essentially. It's not technically blog posts, but it's probably easier to conceptualize that way. I wanted to associate tags with a post, right? And so what I would do is when the user submitted a post and some tags, I would need to ensure that the tags existed in the database. Well, sometimes people would use the same tags over and over again, but I still needed to get them in the database. So what I did is within a transaction, which is something we'll talk about later, I called bulk create on the tag model and set ignore duplicates to true. So in this case, the website involved submitting posts relating to programming. So a tag might be the programming language, say JavaScript. So if somebody had already stored the JavaScript JavaScript tag in the database, I didn't want to have to handle the error and swallow the error and all that kind of stuff. So I just said ignore duplicates to true and SQLize took care of all that for me. And it was frankly really pleasant. I was really chuffed when I learned about that. And I hope you can find it useful in your applications as well. But as far as this video is concerned, that's pretty much all I really want to talk about with regards to inserting records. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully I'll see you in the next video.